So, everybody, this is Love to Hadios. Uh, it's hypermedia for fun and profit. If you're not in the wrong place, go ahead and go where you want to be. Uh, the talk is going to be a little bit conceptual, a little bit of practical advice, um, a lot back end oriented, um, just how to design APIs, RESTful APIs, stuff like that. Uh, I'm Gabe Sulis. I'm a senior engineer at Aquia's Octo. Uh, I'm a JSON API module co maintainer. I really love HTTP2 and just playing around with that. Um, I like reading like RFCs, IETF stuff. It's, uh, it's kind of fun. And I do lose sleep over API design. If we're going to talk about hypermedia um, and how it impacts REST, I think we have to go back to the basics a little bit and look at HTTP and what it is. Um, it's the hypertext transfer protocol. Um, and that's a protocol layer sitting on top of the TCP IP network protocols. Um, and there are a lot of those protocols. Um, you might recognize a few. SMTP, POP, and IMAP, those are all protocols for doing email. SSH, that's for secure shells, remote administration kind of thing. FTP, file transfers. IRC and XMPP is like for chat um, and SOAP if you're a masochist. Um, but HTTP is a little bit different. It's a very special purpose. It's uh, an HTTP is an application language. Uh, all those other ones sing, serve a single purpose, file transfers or administration. Whereas HTTP is kind of a meta thing. It, it's a language for building other applications. And so you kind of see that reflected in like our modern day stuff. You see Gmail is on port 80. It's email and if you're sending like Gmail to Gmail, it's, it's not really using like SMTP or POP or anything like that. If you look at Slack, it's kind of like our IRC or SMT or um, XMPP over port 80. It's using HTTP again. So with HTTP, you can build all the things that you do with those other protocols because it's a descriptive language. Um, so what does that really mean? Uh, the like more technical definition is that it's an application protocol for distributed, collaborative, and hypermedia information systems. And we're going to dig into it. So. If HTTP is an application language, what's its vocabulary? Uh, so the vocabulary is basically a resource. Um, a resource is just a unit of information. It's a concept. It's a thing. Um, it, it can really be anything you want it to be. There's no precise definition. Uh, URIs are the nouns. They identify resources. They're like proper nouns. Methods are the verbs that describe operations on those resources. Statuses are the adjectives that communicate the state of that conversation that you have as you communicate using that language. And messages are the sentences. They contain all of these words, all these things going back and forth. You have requests and responses, and those are both HTTP methods, or messages. Uh, so a URI, Uniform Resource Identifier, uh, we almost always see it as a URL, but it doesn't have to be. A URI can be um, something that's not locatable. The thing that distinguishes a URL from a URI is that a URL is locatable. It can be searched, it can be looked up. Um, whereas if it's not locatable, you can have this thing with its own scheme. It doesn't have to proceed with HTTP. It can just be custom colon slash slash whatever unique identifier you want to have. Uh, the structure begins with uh, a scheme like HTTP, and the scheme doesn't really have to match a protocol. It's just a coincidence that HTTP matches the thing where it's most used. Um, you can have a whole bunch of different ones, like SSH or you know, like I said, custom or Drupal colon. The next part is the host. That kind of identifies where to look for a thing. Um, and then the port, the path, and the query string. That's a uh, more traditional URI. URI. Uh, the next part is methods, right? Git, post, patch, put, delete. Things you're familiar with if you built any like RESTful thing. Uh, they describe actions on a resource. And head and options are about information discovery. They're not really action oriented. Git retrieves a resource, post adds a resource, patch modifies a resource, put replaces a resource, delete removes it, and head determines if it exists. Options determines what's allowed, what are you allowed to do to this thing. 200, 300, 400, 500, you've seen them. Um, they categorize communication. You can think of that back and forth. They have like informational buckets, and then like 203, 204, 205, they further narrow the scope of what's being said. And then there's always a mes message that comes along with that status that further describes and, and articulates what the response is. 200 says understood. 300 is like, maybe you wanted this thing. 
Uh, 400, sorry, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And 500, it's not you, it's me. Uh, so we talked about messages kind of encompassing all of that. They're pretty simple. They always start with a single start line. It's a text-based protocol. Uh, they have a URI and a method, or a status that they return back. They have headers and a body. And headers are the things that describe um, the body, describe the communication. So looking at a very simple response, we see the header is content type text HTML. And what that's saying is everything below this start line is going to be HTML. That's how you should interpret this thing. Um, this one's JSON, and it just says everything below me is JSON. That's how you should interpret it. It could be XML, it could be whatever. Request, super simple. doesn't have to contain a body. The response is the same way. A start line, 200 OK. Maybe you're describing what you're going to send back and the content. All right, so enough about HTTP. Let's talk about REST. Um, so REST stands for Representational State Transfer. Um, I didn't know that for a really long time. I had no idea what it meant. Um, but it's not a protocol. REST is an architectural style, and it defines a set of constraints and properties based on HTTP. And so what that means is it's kind of like OOP is to Java, or Go, or I guess Go is definitely not OOP, but uh, like modern PHP. So REST is to HTTP as OOP is to like modern day Drupal or something. It's a design pattern. It helps you build systems in a unique and scalable way, reusable. Um, it standardizes it, right? Um, I have some bad news. REST is kind of over. I don't think we should call it REST anymore. Um, Steve Klavnik designed that little uh, thing. He was the person who wrote the JSON API spec. He had this on his blog. I thought it was interesting. What he suggests is that we call it the Hypermedia API. Um, and what that means is it really communicates the centrality of Hypermedia to a good RESTful API. Um, RESTful, you know, if you think about it, representational state transfer, it's just about moving resources back and forth. Um, whereas Hypermedia says there's something more and something important to your API. Uh, maybe it's just pedantic, um, maybe it's just branding, but I think it's a lot more fun to say happy, or my API is happy, than it is to say it's restful. <laughs> That's a terrible joke. All right, uh, so what are the principles of a hypermedia API, or a restful API? Uh, client server is one. It's a separation of concerns. We're at the decouple dev days, or Drupal days. Um, you know what it is, you separate your data storage from your presentation. You keep a separation of concerns there. The server handles the data, and it's the foundational thing for decoupled sites. It's what we want to do. It lets us have multiple consumers of our data. It lets us have an iPad, an iPhone, a computer, a kiosk, whatever those things are. By isolating the presentational details of that device on the client, you can keep the storage of that data more uniform um, so that it can serve all those different needs better. And of course, it's becoming more and more relevant, right? Proliferation of devices. The, like beginning we saw a talk earlier today about like all the kiosks and museums, it's becoming more and more necessary to think about your, your sites in this way. Um, to contrast that client server architecture, the idea of two things talking to one another, you can think about um, a peer-to-peer -peer network. Think about Git or um, maybe torrents or like BitTorrent or something like that. The idea is that every node in the system is actually being both a client and a server. They're, they're one and the same, right? There's no central location or repository. Another principle of that design is stateless. Every request and response has to be independent. And so the way I like to illustrate this is, let's say I make a request to some uh, server, and the request is exactly the same, and I say, give me this resource, right? And I'm doing a get request. And I get a 403 access denied. It says it's forbidden. I'm not allowed to get that thing. If I then go to a login page, and I log in, I do all my stuff, and then I send that exact same request that I did before, I should still get the 403. And what I mean by that is, with that exact request, you don't change any headers, you don't do anything different, the server doesn't know that that second request is different from the first one. What we're used to in HTTP is when you do that login thing, it says it sends a set cookie, and that says, on all subsequent requests, add the cookie header. And so if you were to do that, then you'd get the, the 200, right? So it's every request contains all the information it needs to authenticate with the server. Um, you can't, you don't have to maintain on maintain state. So uh, the server doesn't say like, oh, okay, this IP address is authenticated. Next time I'll let them see the content. It's self-contained. 
And that's important for other principles, like cacheability. Um, a response should contain information to govern its own intermediate storage. If you're going to send it to a client, the browser should, browser should be able to look at that response and say, I can store this for five days, or I can store it until something changes, or maybe I can't cache it at all. It always needs to be kept up to date. Um, and that purpose is to eliminate requests and responses and lower latency, um, or the time it takes for a request to get to a server and come back. Um, and so it scales performance. It means you don't have to maintain state. You don't have to be writing to a database all the time with IP addresses. It means you can put in caching in between to improve that performance. That's related to another principle, a layered system. It's the idea that if you're going to build a backend, you should be able to build it in such a way that you can add layers in between and it should still continue to function as you expect. So practically what that means is like, let's say you're developing on a local machine and you have your React client or your node thing and you say yarn start and you start developing and you've got a local instance of Drupal. When you then move to production and your production has a CDN in front of it or varnish or something like that, it should still operate the same way. You shouldn't have to change the way that the two communicate. You can insert those intermediate layers to improve performance um, and everything should operate the same. Um, this is kind of the black sheep principle of REST. Uh, it's optional, and it's kind of out of vogue. It used to be a big thing with Java and Java applets. The idea was that you could send code to a client, and they could execute that code uh, locally to have, it would allow you to evolve your systems a little bit easier. I think we'll actually see a resurgence of that. I think in the future, we're going to see more and more of this case. And what I like to think about is like WebAssembly, if you've heard of that. Like imagine YouTube decides that they want to um, send video requests. They want to have an HTTP API for YouTube, and they want to really compress that video content. Maybe they could ship a, a decompressor binary thing in Wasm and give you that in the RESTful API, and then you could decode that browser content. What that would allow them to do is just keep going faster and faster, making their compressor, compression better without necessarily waiting for Chrome or Firefox to catch up right, with the, the latest standard in compression. So I think we'll see more of that. And you can, you can imagine using uh, code on demand for your APIs today. Let's say you want to have um, like a form for a, for a particular node or something like that. You can imagine shipping validator code, validation code, to validate the fields in that, that form that you're building, right? To say, does it have a maximum length? Is it related to this thing? And you could have that all centralized so that you don't have to change all the applications in different places. You ship that validation logic with it. The uniform interface is that entity representations are decoupled from their storage. And we can think like if you have a MySQL database, right? You don't, you could imagine like some system that just puts an HTTP post in it and you just post an SQL query to the database. But we don't do that, right? We don't let you just post random SQL and get the response back. We actually try and like abstract it away. We say like we're going to have users, or we're going to have articles, we're going to have these ideas that create a uniform interface, even if we have it in MySQL or Mongo, or maybe it's a field versus a node. We can still access them in the same way, and that's that uniform interface principle. Okay, so what's all the ship, like the buzz about? What's this hypermedia thing? Um, this is text. Okay, so I'm a teapot, short and stout. Um, voila, we've got hypertext. That's all it is. It's some text with links in it. Uh, you've seen it before, it's not new. And this is hypermedia. What it is, is it's JSON. This is hyperJSON, and it's got links to other content. The idea is that hypermedia is just media that you add links to. So you might think, all right, what's a link? I know what that is, it's a blue thing I click on. Um, it's a lot more than that. Uh, a link can be viewed as a statement. It takes the form, this URI has a relation type, resource at this URI, which has target attributes. A little bit more simply, it's like this web page or this resource thing has a link that means this um, to that place over there. And I'm going to just give you a little hint about what that thing over there is. A link relation type identifies the semantics of a link. What's the relationship that this link represents? Um, if we look at these two examples, we've got, you know, we can imagine this on some page, and we are providing a guide. And in that rel, rel 
attribute there, we say it's help. And that means this thing represents help. This is where you get help for this page. The next example says, here's cart four. What is that thing? It's a link to my cart. My cart would tell everybody, this is a thing that goes to my cart, whether I'm Joe, Bob, or Sally. My cart remains the same, but the link can change. A target attribute just hints information about that linked to resource. So we can look at that same example again, expanded with some more attributes. And what we can see here is that hreflang describes says, well, this resource is available in English, French, and Spanish. Same with the my cart thing. We can say the title of that cart should be checkout. So you might be able to use that to inform the text that you put into a button or something like that. Um, hypermedia is the foundation of the web. The web is based on hypermedia. Um, so what does that mean? We can think of the web as just a graph, a graph of things, nodes related by edges. Um, and those nodes, and nodes are resources and the web pages are the web pages and the edges are those links between them. So let's take a, a common example, right? Here, here's index.html and it's you know your standard thing and it has a link. And that link doesn't have to be in an A tag, it can be in an image tag and says the source is here.jpg. And so now we're saying this index.html is composed of something more. It also has the hero. Perhaps it also links out to style. And that style lives up in the head of the HTML document. But that too has links. The type or CSS. It has a URL to uh, some assets. A separator might also go to um, some font or something like that. The idea is that it creates this web of resources that all compose the one page, that resource, that home page, that index.html. Um, so we're used to thinking of you know, the web more like this, that idea that there's a home page and there's another page over here. It maybe has posts or about, and that links to an individual post and another individual post. But those are, those are the same thing. So we think about this, we're on the home page, and then we want to move to the post page. We click that link, and all of a sudden, the graph reorganizes. The root of that graph is, or the tree, is posts. And now more of that web is revealed to us. Right? We see posts one, post two, and post two, if we were to follow that link, we might get to posts author and the post tags. We could keep traversing that web, moving through the graph, moving through, driving our, our interaction with it. We could do that again move to post two, now it's at the root of our tree, and we see that if we were to go to the po like post two's tags, we might see tags one and tags two. That thing just expands as we move through, now swim through this web, driven by hypermedia, driven by links. Um, and I did a little trick here, right? We started with index.html and the hero image and the fonts and stuff like that. We moved to a traditional website, and now we also see that this thing looks just like a REST API, right? It's all the same. And so your API is that interconnected bit of resources just like a home page is or just like a, a, a website is. It has connections between all the resources there. So going into more depth on what an API might provide, you'd see API slash content. That might be a list listing of content, a listing of nodes in our terms. And there might be a link to a schema, there might be a link to a second page of those resources. And that within that content, you might have a direct link to the comments for, for item one. You could follow that through, you'd get page two, you get page two's, or the posts on page two's comments. You might follow page three. And you see that there's a page four, so on and so forth, but maybe there's not comments, right? There is no link to a comments for that page three. And then maybe there's no more links, right? You can't follow that any further and you get a leaf on that tree. So that, I want to talk about how that relates to difficult questions in API design. So these are ones that I think a lot of people struggle with. It seems like they should be easy, but when you actually start implementing it in an API, these questions come up and you wonder, how can I solve them in an elegant way? Like, how many pages are there? Am I allowed to delete that thing? I know that if I send a delete request, that's how I do it, but can I? Will I get a 403? Is my shopping cart empty, right? Can I make a bank withdrawal? Does it have funds in it, in other words? Um, 
a lot of questions, how should I structure the URL of an, AP, of an API? What should I worry about, you know, if it's slash host, slash ID, slash something? Do I need to worry about that? And if so, how do I do it? Um, how do I use pretty URLs in my application? You know, if you've built a more content-oriented site, not something that might be on a phone or something like that, you've wondered, like, this thing is super ugly. It's got a UUID on it. It's not something that's SEO friendly. How do I use those pretty uh, URLs? Or how do I represent vari variations of a single thing, right? Whether it's revisions or translations, does that have a separate URL? And if so, how does it work? Um, how, do I, how do I add an item to my cart? Um, so the answer to that is that we can drive that client-server interaction through hypermedia. Um, Hideos, Hideos, Hideous, whatever it is, hypermedia is the engine of application state. Um, so Hideos is like hyperdrive. It's an engine that drives this interaction. It moves things forward. It helps you traverse and swim through that tree of resources, that web. Um, using hypermedia, we can provide related resources. We can provide available variants or available actions. And if we're using hypermedia, we can solve all those questions in, in elegant ways that are standardized and reusable and allow you to write JavaScript clients for one application that'll work for another. Um, so what kind of things might be, would related resources be? So we can think if we were on that content page, a related resource might be the next page, the subsequent page. If we were at the end of those, those pages of collections, we might have a previous, and that's related in some way. Uh, the first and the last pages of that same collection, maybe an entity's author is related in some way. Um, similar products, contextual resources. So there are other resources, but they contextualize the thing we're on. So it might be tags or categories. You might say, I have a node and it belongs to an article. That's a node type, right? Links can tell us that information. What do I mean by available variants? I kind of hinted at it before. Uh, revisions, translations, product variants. Small, medium, and large, red, green, or blue. I should say I, did, I know almost nothing about commerce, so this is just in the abstract. Um, available actions, like can I add, add to this collection? Can I remove this thing? Can I revise this thing? Purchase pay. Can I relate resource A to resource B? And what does that mean? might be like the add to cart button, right? Okay, so those things I'm talking about, what are those examples? So we can think like of an Instagram homepage and you want to implement that infinite scroller. How do you know when to stop, you know? You might decide that 25 items make sense, but is that everything that's available? What if there's only 12 available? What if there's 25,000? How do you know when you've reached the end of that thing? We can use, sorry, we can use links to communicate that, right? In the response document, you can add that next link, and you can always just check, is the next link there or is it not? If so, I know whether it exists or it doesn't exist, if I should keep paginating through this. Because the resources in your collection might change. If you've got a distributed backend, you might say, like, I want a page of 25 items, but maybe you only get 23 uh, because something was taking too long. So by using this hypermedia, we can solve those problems of um, distributed backends or client code that would take too long to run and you, they didn't have time to fill your response um, with all the items. The last page would just let you jump to that end item. Um, also, I talked about contextual um, links, right? Or things that relate. So if we look at this thing, this data is probably just providing a collection of birds, right? But what if we only wanted birds of a particular family, right? Birds of paradise, crows, ravens, and jays. We could use links to represent those, to transmit that, that thing. If you go to this URL, you're going to have just birds of paradise. If you go to this one, you'll have um, just crows, ravens, and jays. You can use that attribute, that title attribute that we saw in the, UR in the link definition earlier to give it a pretty name. It doesn't have to be Paradise CI Day or whatever, <laughs> you know? You can actually give it a thing, and you might use that in a menu. Menus are another hard problem in decoupled sites. You can make use of link attributes to, to solve that problem. 
here's something I just went to this morning to grab a screenshot. It's like a configurator for buying a new Mustang, right? You have these variations of the same product. It's you know black, green, red, blue, whatever it is. How do you communicate um, things about doing that variation, right? So, for example, if I choose to change the color, I might have a price change. It adds cost to my thing. I could add that logic in some way to my client. I could say, add, um, you know, go fetch this resource over the year and figure out what that variation costs and add that logic in my client and display it here. Or I could just put it as an attribute of the link to it, right? I could say the cost of this resource, this other paint color, this other variation, it's an attribute. That's what it is. It's cost. And then I can display it here without making complicated logic. And the server can change that quite easily. And if the way that you want to fetch that changes, you can still present it in a way so that the client doesn't have to be updated. So how would that look? You know, maybe we've got a site that sells t-shirts. Um, the href is the URL, the URI. It says this is the variant. It's at 1 slash A. Its color is 033FF. I don't even know if that's marine, but that's what we're going to call it. And, uh, you know, if we look back at that example we saw before, we saw those colors, right? The black, the ingot silver, ruby red. That is just, it's fine. It's fine if that's a link attribute. You can put it in there and you can communicate that without extra, extra work on the client side. And then you can give it a human readable name. Looking at this, we can see like the variance in terms of revision IDs, right? So we're looking at post one, post two, and we want to get the latest version of a thing. Um, in the first example on post one, we're saying this representation of post one is ID revision ID 27, and the latest version is 29. But in the second one, we see that those two are the same, so we can tell our client, don't fetch the latest version if these URIs match. Right? We can add that logic and use hypermedia to describe that. Um, and this is kind of cool. This is probably the first time you've seen things like that. But this week, we're going to add, or hopefully this week or next, we'll add this to JSON API. We want to do revision support, and it's going to look kind of like that. And one of the cool things is that if you see that ID colon 29, you can get a specific revision ID. What we're going to do is then have like rel or rel colon, latest version, canonical, and you can use that attribute to say, like, give me the canonical version without knowing the ID ahead of time. Um, what about this, right? We've seen this, uh, this thing before. Look at those edit links, right? You know that I just happen to be an admin here. But what if you're trying to implement a second front end where you're only allowed to delete your own nodes, right? You could hard code logic into the client that says if my user ID is equal to the UID of the node, then don't show a delete link, right? But what if that changes over time? What if it's like I can delete my own nodes for the first five minutes and after that it has to be kept archived or something like that? The trick there is that you can use links to describe that. You can say add the link object, give it a title of edit and a relationship of edit that relationship has meaning. It can inform your client, this is the place I go to edit this thing. Or, you know, on this second one, I'm allowed to delete it. And there's something new there, right? We see that Drupal colon slash slash link relation. This thing doesn't exist. Um, it's not a thing that you can go look up. It doesn't start with HTTP. It's not a URL. The idea is that you can create unique identifiers, and that rel, that relationship type, can categorize what that link means. Delete, you know, it doesn't have a standardized meaning, but in Drupal it does. So if you're building an application, you can create your own relation types and document that fact. You can tell implementers of the client, whether it's on the phone or the browser or anything, you can say, when you see this specific rel, you know, this relationship, it means this. You can program logic around that, and you can make whatever you want. It doesn't have to be like a list of um, registered relation types. You can customize them to your needs. And they can tell you things like, what are the methods that are allowed for that? How do I do it? How do I um, present it? So here's another kind of hard problem thing. What if that was out of stock, right? And so that add to cart button has to become add to wish list. 
Um, again, the links can help you there. So here's one case. You can imagine you ask for that, that page, that representation of the product, and it says um, there's an add to cart link, and you can put it there, and what that tells the client is it's in stock, right? But you don't have to code it. It doesn't have to make an HTTP request to your like backend storage thing and find out what's the quantity of things available. It's either that link is there or it's not there. That simplifies the logic and it lets you evolve that logic over time. Uh, here we again create a custom relationship type and it says this link is a relate thing. And you can code a client to learn this is what I'm supposed to do when I get a relate link. And in this case, it has a template, and it says, if I want to add this thing to my cart, I should do what I'm supposed to do when I relate things. And I'm going to send a post request to this URI, and it's going to have this body. And so you can imagine if the cart, cart4, you see that href there, is a REST resource, then if you post this content that it gives you, it's going to add this item to your cart. And that lets you evolve that over time. What if your cart changes? What if um, you want to do something different, or the IDs change, or things like that? Using this format, you can, you can just change the logic on the back end without changing that front end logic. All right. Uh, and here's the other example, right? If the thing was out of stock, we could just replace it with an add to wish list. And instead of sending it to wish list uh, five, or cart four, we'll send it to wish list five. And the idea is the same. We're going to post this content to the thing. And in both cases, I'll point out that under that self thing is a CTA. So we just tell our front end to look for the CTA link, put that text in it, and just do the behavior that it describes. Don't do the thing that don't have to have like a separate CTA. You just have the link describe what's supposed to happen with that interaction. Um, and that's the end. Just open it up for questions right away. No. Does JSON API let you plug in metadata yet into the links? Uh, no. no. I want to add that like in a week or two. Okay. Yeah. Because that's exciting, but I just didn't think it was alterable yet. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'll just repeat the question. It was, does JSON API let you do that today? And the answer is, we can do it soon. Uh, here. You talk uh, earlier about tricky URLs. Yeah. Uh, do you have any insights or thoughts about uh, that uh, how for them? Yeah, yeah. So um, about resolving the content. Yeah. So I talked about that first question. I, I should have put an example in about like how do you structure your API URLs, right? Do you put it under slash posts or slash five, you know, articles five? And how do you change that over time? The answer is that REST has no like opinion about how you do that. And so there's no particular reason that you can't have a pretty URL for a node. Like it's just a constraint built into the JSON API module right now is that it looks for that thing. But if we were to put um, in the list of links, you know, an alias version instead of the CTA there, the alias could have the href to the pretty URL. You could use that in the client. And then your backend could just resolve it to the appropriate JSON API response. Um, I was thinking about building that soon. So um, basically saying that we should keep the original node, the Drupal node URL, and just uh, get it with some custom. Yeah, with a little bit of magic. Yes. Um, and it's not wrong. Like if your URL is not, you know, node slash article slash five, it'll work. Um, it doesn't matter if you're using hypermedia well your client should be able to adapt to a different URL structure uh, without, without issue. Uh, Peter. Can you just talk a little bit more about revision? I know right now we're having trouble with not being able to create a revision when it's getting it with JSON API or updating it, actually. Um, are we just being dumb in how we're using it that we can't even create a, create a new revision right now? And what revision support are you adding? Uh, you're not being dumb? doesn't work. Uh, I would encourage you to file an issue or add to the current one. Um, there's one, the title is just revision support, and that opinion would be great. I keep forgetting to repeat the question. It was just, can JSON API create new revisions? And the answer is no. Um, right now, this initial thing that I've shown with the research version equals, it is read-only. Uh, we plan to do 
read only first and then write afterwards. Um, but yeah, we just need to make it work. It's not you, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> 500. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Cool, we'll enjoy an extra long lunch.